everyone. Thank you for being here. This is the Eliminating Red Worms and Midge Flies presentation for the Aquafix 2021 Wastewater Webinar Series. Today I'm your presenter, John Deneen, the Technical Director here at Aquafix. I'll give you a first just a real quick background on who Aquafix is and what we do for folks who aren't familiar with us yet. Um, at our core, what we are is a wastewater research laboratory. We're located in Madison, Wisconsin, and the research laboratory is based in the University of Wisconsin's research park. What we do inside the lab is have a team of really qualified microbiologists and chemists who take in samples from wastewater operators all around the country every day, and they help those operators to understand what's going on in their treatment plant. A lot of times it's troubleshooting around the areas of filaments, but also do uh, a full micro exam with every report there. The other big thing that happens in our lab is uh, research and development. And the research is centered around some of the tougher challenges in wastewater treatment. We're real experts in nitrification cycles and just challenges that operators might, might face. We're real good at taking what we learn in the lab and formulating uh, bacterial and probiotic products to help solve some of those challenges. Uh, so like I'd mentioned, the, the bulk of the company is based in Wisconsin, a lot of folks in our research lab and also our production facility there. I'm uh, based out of an office here in central Ohio. So today what we'll be covering is uh, wastewater redworms. So the first section we're going to talk about what are wastewater redworms and why do we care about them. Uh, we'll talk about a biological larvicide called BTI, which is our recommendation for how to get rid of these pests. And then we'll uh, talk about how to actually treat with BTI. And then we'll talk about special situations at the end. The treatment section is gonna be geared a little more towards activated sludge treatment plants. If you don't have an activated sludge treatment plant, I'll be covering some of those cases in the special situations. So lagoon folks, uh, trickling filter folks, uh, people with UV treatment, uh, you'll be getting a lot of nice information out of sections one and two, and then we'll come to you in section four as well. So if you're here, you probably is a pretty good chance that you recognize these midge flies and red worms pictured on the screen. So the midge flies pictured on the left here look pretty similar to mosquitoes, and we'll talk about how they're different in a little bit. And the red worm pictured on the right just kind of looks like a red worm. So what are these pests? What they are is a non-biting midge. They actually come from the same lineage as a mosquito, uh, but they're a, a separate family, very closely related to mosquitoes though. The red worm is the larval stage of the midge fly, and together they're in a species called Chironomus. In more detail, uh, these red worms tend to be up to about two inches long. Uh, a typical size that I see most often is at like three quarters of an inch to around an inch. Uh, these red worms of note are not really a worm, so they are the larval stage of a midge fly, which means they will hatch into those flies. Hemoglobin is what gives the, the midge its color, so that's the same thing that gives our blood its red color, and it's present in these red worms and it helps them to fixate oxygen. Uh, so they're actually pretty, pretty good at living in low dissolved oxygen environments. The midge fly itself, as I mentioned, looks quite a bit like a mosquito and commonly gets mistaken for a mosquito. Uh, the big difference here is that there's no stinger, also known as a proboscis to entomologists, and uh, so they don't actually bite you. They uh, do have a distinct feather-like antenna on the males and not on the females. So there's your little, uh, little note about them. Here's an example of a male midge fly, and you can see that antenna. Uh, the antenna here is at the, at the top of the head, and this is a closely related species. I don't think it is actually exactly the midge fly that you would find in a wastewater treatment plant. So where do midge flies come from? They exist naturally all throughout the world. Um, the only places where you don't see them are in deserts that are completely void of water. They exist primarily in natural water bodies, and in the cases of wastewater treatment plants, those natural water bodies are all, you know, all around your treatment plant, well within the flying range of these midge flies. Uh, so the midge fly species that ends up in wastewater treatment plants is well adapted to fairly anoxic conditions and fairly low water quality conditions. 
In nature, uh, those larvae are feeding on decaying organics in relatively slow moving sections of streams. And another little note uh, about the flies is they're actually, and the larvae for that matter, are actually a pretty important uh, food source for fish in the various streams where these midges populate. Uh, fly fishermen actually, I've seen some great examples of really intricately and well tied fly fishing ties that are meant to mimic the wastewater midge fly. Here's an example of their life cycle in nature. Uh, so at the top here, we have adult male, adult female, and when they get together and mate, the female then lays some eggs, eggs go down to the bottom and hatch into larvae. The larvae are then consuming organics. There's a very short pupa stage before you end up with an adult midge fly. So how do midge flies end up in wastewater treatment plants? Uh, what happens is the female carrying its eggs lands in some of the slower moving water and lays up to around 3000 eggs. Uh, this often happens during the warmer months and during lower flow water temperatures. And the most common spot where we see this happen is secondary clarifiers. And that's the conditions that mimic their natural habitat the most closely. Here on the screen now we have a red worm. So as the eggs get laid, they turn into a red worm relatively quickly. And the biggest thing of note here about red worms is that while they're in your treatment plant, they are feasting on the mixed liquor. They're consuming the nutrients that happen in, to be in the mixed liquor. And that gives them a very high survival rate. The larval stage tends to last for up to a couple of weeks and shorter during the cold weather seasons and longer during warm weather. The return activated sludge brings the population to the aeration basin where potentially they can burrow down into sludge there. And the worms then form cocoons in sludge and organics. Here are some examples of those cocoons that I was just mentioning. So the worm actually will proactively build a cocoon around itself. And they do this for a couple reasons. One is it's a defense mechanism. It kind of protects them. And the other reason they do this is the, they're actually providing themselves a food source from what I understand. But so if you have red worms cocooning in your treatment system, then you might potentially recognize some of this. We'll talk in more detail about those cocoons coming up. So uh, issues caused by the red worms, this is really why we care about them. Um, like I'd mentioned, they're consuming mixed liquor when they're in your plant. Um, another common thing that they can cause in terms of issues is clumping or sticking together of the sludge in your secondary clarifier. So folks who have bad populations of red worms in their plant, a lot of times they'll notice their return activated sludge is a little thin or a little stringy. And that's because the worms are actually causing almost a stickiness to the sludge that causes the returns to not perform the way they have uh, or the way they're intended to. We have some folks who mention when they have bad red worm outbreaks, they might get some rising solids in their clarifiers as well. So here I'm showing you what the, the pupa stage looks like. This is a very short lived stage, just happens in between the, uh, the red worm and the adult fly. And basically this is where they're going from the bottom of their environment um, up to the surface and they'll very quickly hatch into the adult fly. Adult flies, a little more detail on them. Uh, once they emerge, the males swarm and their focus entirely is on mating. Uh, so then that's the same for the females as well. They mate and then their life is pretty much over. The adult lifespan of the, the flies is around two days. So other than just mating and dying, they really don't do much else. Uh, the flies can also cause some issues. One being that they're just an absolute nuisance and neighbors, if you have a bunch of uh, housing near your treatment plant, for example, might uh, complain about them. But just as operators as well, I know that uh, Operators don't enjoy being swarmed by midge flies when they're entering a building, say like in a UV disinfection room or out working on clarifiers for whatever reason, those flies tend to have a knack for just flying straight into your mouth. And when you think about where they've been, you don't necessarily appreciate that. Yeah, I'm seeing in the comments here that we've got folks mentioning uh, clumping solids and rising solids that I'd mentioned as a cause or related to the cause of the actual worms. And that same plant here, spider webs. Yeah, it's, it's just a, a general housekeeping issue as well. 
um, spider webs getting built, uh, especially for indoor and enclosed areas, those spider webs can be a problem, but also then end up attracting birds that just overall are general housekeeping issue. So up next, we're going to be talking about treatments for red worms and getting rid of them with uh, one of our products that's BTI based. So that's kind of our background on, on the flies and, and worms and why they matter. First question that's come in, uh, someone who I think might have some experience with our treatments already, probably uh, asking about an expiration date on, on Aquabac XT. We say one year shelf life. It's not that it's going to go to zero effectiveness beyond one year, um, but plan on using up your supply within a year. If you have extra, it's not going to hurt anything to use the stuff that's past the shelf life. You just may not get quite the same bang from it. So now we're talking about treatments. Aquabac XT is the product that we do for treating midge flies and red worms. And what it is, is an EPA registered biolarvicide. And the way that it works is by breaking the cycle and killing the worms. What makes it a biolarvicide is that the active ingredient is actually a bacteria strain that's abbreviated as BTI. And I'll tell you quite a bit more about what BTI is. But just know that uh, for this moment that Aquabac XT is registered by the ETA as a biological larvicide, and it's a bacteria that kills redworms. So BTI is an acronym for the name of the actual bacteria species. Uh, the bacterial species is Bacillus thuringiensis israelanius. And it was discovered in Israel in 1976. Uh, from what I understand, uh, there was a certain water body that had no mosquitoes in it. Well, all the surrounding ones did. And so studying that particular one to find out why it did not yielded this particular bacteria strain. Um, so it's pretty amazing stuff. Uh, mosquitoes were the thing that it was originally found and developed for, for in terms of like a treatment and control option. But very closely related fly species are also affected by it. So beyond the mosquito, obviously we have the, the midge fly that's common in wastewater. Uh, the other targets for BTI, it'll kill the larval stage of a black fly. Uh, it'll kill the larval stage of a filter fly. And we've also seen in at least our lab setting that we're able to use this stuff to control bristle worms in the treatment microcosms that we have where we're growing like synthetic activated sludge for certain experiments. So how does BTI work? In the case of Aquabac, it's sold in a uh, spore forming stage uh, that's added to water. Uh, so you pour it into your system right in the spot where the red worms are active. And then the bacteria creates a crystalline protein that actually kills the worms by disrupting their digestive tract. So the alkalinity in the, the worm's stomach activates it, and then that produces six endotoxins. Those toxins bind to the cells in the digestive tract and rupture those cells. Ultimately, what ends up happening is the, the worms die of starvation because of this ruptured and, and messed up digestive tract. So the alkalinity in their stomachs activating these endotoxins is one of the important things about why it's so specific in its targets. One of the handouts that we have uh, that I'll share at the end was that research paper that we put together. And a couple things you'll find in there are more detailed explanations of exactly how those endotoxins work. And here, one of the things that's also contained in is just this, this image of some of the proteins. So when a targeted species consumes BTI, the endotoxins bind to their epithelial cells within their stomach lining, where the internal stomach alkalinity activates a parasporal body toxin. The toxins are then released, causing the stomach to swell and burst. So just kind of reiterating, but there's uh, even more detail and additional information in that handout. So why do we like Aquabac XT as the best treatment for midge flies and red worms and wastewater? The first is that it actually targets the, the larvae. Uh, so killing the flies really ends up being a fool's errand. Uh, I've talked to so many plants where if, especially if they have like an enclosed area where the flies are emerging, where they'll use like these mosquito bombs and they kill the fly, but if you're not actually killing the red worm itself, you're never gonna get ahead of it and you're just constantly gonna be chasing your tail. So that's the biggest, one of the big things we love about Aquabac XT is that it kills the, the, the right 
part of the cycle to actually break the cycle. And the other thing we really like is that it's so safe to use. So it's so specific in its targets, only affecting certain fly species. Um, and the good news is that there's no concerns about effluent toxicity when you're using the stuff. When you add this uh, product to your treatment plant, you're gonna have no negative impact on the good bacteria that are in your plant. You're also not gonna have any issues with effluent toxicity testing if that's something you monitor for. So this stuff will have no effect on Daphnia, minnows, or other non-targeted species. The other thing we like, it's safe to use. Just standard PPE is, is all you need for this stuff. And then one other thing I'll mention, uh, as far as reasons we like it, is that there's not been any resistance that's ever been discovered related to use of BTI treatments. So those six toxins work together very effectively. And because there are six separate toxins, it's kind of theorized that that's one of the big reasons why resistance has never been developed. So when the stuff was discovered in the 70s, one of the big questions for any pesticide is, how long until resistance occurs. Most pesticides uh, resistance management programs are a bit an important part of using a pesticide if you're gonna be working with things that have a short lifespan. So it's been studied since the 1970s and there's been no examples of resistance found to it. So that's it's another really nice feature to Aquabac. Next, we'll go into dosing plans. So how do we actually use the Aquabac? The other handout that I have set for you guys is one of our product sheets. So our product sheets tend to all follow a similar format where on the front side, we'll tell you a little bit about what each product is and why it works. And on the back side, we'll give you specific dosing information for different treatment scenarios. So at the end, you'll be able to download that from handouts as well. But let's look a little more specifically uh, about how to use it here. So when you're using the Aquabac, we have you add it directly to the areas where the redworms are most prevalent. In a lot of cases, that's the secondary clarifiers, but folks who mentioned sand filters, you would add it just right, right to your sand filters. Same with disc filters, um, lagoons, just anywhere in the head of the lagoon, maybe near an aerator to help spread it out. Standard dosing for an activated sludge plant would be a slug dose once per week. So you don't need to do a metering pump. In fact, it's better not to. And so we recommend just a once per week dose. It's pretty easy to achieve. Uh, after most folks we have start with a two week uh, kind of like initial dose where you do a heavier dose and you add twice per week for those two weeks. But then after that transitioning just to the maintenance dose and that maintenance dose would be for the active midge fly season. Some folks really like to do a second heavy dosing stage uh, in late fall, right around just before the time where the midge flies typically go dormant, just to get one more good kill in before the end of the year. Uh, normal dosing, it, volumes are pretty low. The stuff works at really, really low concentrations. For a typical, let's say 500,000 gallon per day treatment plant, you might be looking at adding a little over a gallon for your initial dose for those first two weeks. And then after that, a little over a half gallon uh, beyond that. So we've got that dosing sheet to help you calculate exactly how much you'll need for your system. And those are based on the flow through the system more so than the, the size of the lagoon or of the wastewater treatment plant. Another question I get pretty frequently is, so how long will I actually need to treat with this stuff? And the answer in a large part depends on the climate you're in. So in Wisconsin, say Ohio, where I'm at, Massachusetts, our customers in Pennsylvania, for example, uh, they're, I would consider to be cold weather climates. And so typically you're not gonna see the red worms remain active through the winter. Now you generally are not actually killing the red worms when the cold water temperatures come. What actually happens is they go dormant. And so they stop hatching into new flies during those colder water temperatures. A good rule of thumb, if the water isn't frozen, then the eggs and the, the red worms are able to survive. So overwintering does happen, especially if you're not treating. There may be some cold weather climates where you end up seeing the flies year round. And what would typically cause that would be as if you have enclosed portions of your treatment process. So if you have enclosed UV building, for example, then you might see them year round. Warmer weather climates, uh, let's just go clear to the extreme. Let's say South Florida in the United States, where it never gets that cold, you're probably looking at treating year round. Uh, looks like we have a question here. All right, so we have 
two AB tanks, would we divide the recommended dose between the two or would that amount be to each tank? So figure out what the total flow is into your plant and whatever the chart says for your dose, just divide it evenly between the two. So yeah, uh, in the example that we just talked about, you would want to split that dose. So other dosing locations, we talked about disc filter. Yeah, disc filters is something I had mentioned, UV buildings. In a lot of cases, I'll go with the UV first. Uh, in closed UV buildings, we'll see tons of flies emerging right at that spot. In a lot of cases, what I find is that still the biggest population of the red worms is gonna be in the secondary clarifiers. And when the red worms pupate, they go up into the water column and get washed over the weirs and end up emerging in the UV building. But usually the biggest population of worms is not in the UV channels. So in those cases, I still recommend focusing your treatment on the secondary clarifiers. But if you want, you can also do a little, a little additional dose just ahead of your UV system. There can be scenarios where you end up with red worms that are actually thriving in, in the channels and knocking those out usually just once or twice will take care of them and then you can just treat the clarifiers. Disc filters, another example. So when we talk about the things that red worms like, they love burrowing into sludge. Uh, they're just as happy to burrow into the filter media. You know, the media is there to collect solids and organics and so it's a perfect food source and uh, we've seen lots of disc filters of all types and varieties where the worms are very happy. Sim pretty similar concept in the sand filters as well. Uh, the goal when you're treating these areas, we know the worms are actively in that spot, so is to actually just put your dose right in the basin where the filters are contained. And if you're able to do it like after a routine maintenance, you might expose more of them, but still probably just like a weekly dose is typically what we'd see. Uh, got another question here. Typically their uh, basins are 60 to 70 Fahrenheit in the winter. Um, will they go dormant or will we need to treat year round? This is in South Carolina. 60 to 70, that's water temperature. Probably still the air temperature is actually going to be cold enough that you're not going to get new eggs being laid in your system year round. You may still get a little bit of emergence, but I would expect mostly the issue in your area, you're kind of on this boundary line. I would expect mostly there's probably not a big issue in the winter. You may find you need to treat year round, but if I had to guess for your location, I would think you get at least a solid three months off from treating. So now we're gonna talk about boosting the effectiveness. There's really only one limiting factor in terms of how successful your Aquabac treatment will be. And that's if the Aquabac's not coming into contact with some portion of the worms. So it's deadly effective stuff on any of the red worms that it comes into contact with. You're gonna kill 99% of them. Um, the only ones that aren't going to die is the ones that never come into contact with the active ingredient in the Aquabac. And so this is where we come back to those cocoons that I had mentioned that they'll proactively build. As you can imagine, if you added some Aquabac to the secondary clarifier where those worms are uh, burrowed into these cocoons, it may not necessarily touch all of them. Just for perspective, if you scraped the side of that weir, you'd see lots of red worms emerging from those clumps. And the same for this, I think this was a chain for a clarifier rake actually on the right hand side, just covered in those cocoons. And same thing, if you scrape it, worms will emerge. And uh, let's say you scraped it right around the time you added aqua back, well, you'd kill all of them that emerge. Um, so the only thing that limits aqua back's success is the extent of this cooning, cocooning or settled sludge. And we've got ways to, to deal with that to get you to the absolute best maximum possible treatment. Folks who don't have much of this going on, we'd expect 90% reduction of the red worms with the Aquabac treatment. If you have a lot of cocooning or a lot of settled sludge, then it becomes pretty important to address that while you're doing your treatment. So speaking of settled sludge, here's a few examples of that. On the right-hand side on this, uh, these two images, you can see a lot of settled sludge in this basin. And you could imagine, again, if it were filled with water, that there might be a bunch of red worms burrowed down into that sludge. And then same thing on the left here, a common spot where you might have settled sludge in an aeration basin. When you've got bottom diffusers might be right underneath those diffusers. 
you can actually see the reddish tint here to this settled sludge is just masses of these red worms. And that can, that kind of gives you a sense of the scale. If each one of those red worms are, you know, very narrow and uh, three quarters of an inch long, we're talking hundreds of thousands of them in the bottom of that basin. Aquabat could kill any of them that you see right here. But the ones that are cocooned are a little tougher. So how we deal with that is our bug juice. And what bug juice does is it degrades those cocoons. We actually developed bug juice to be used in aerobic digesters. And so what it was designed to do in aerobic digesters is help break down some of these insoluble BODs that end up in the digesters. Things like paper fragments and pieces of lint and waxes, things that are able to settle out, say in your primary clarifiers or uh, later in your secondary clarifiers if they make it through that and things that you don't necessarily need the bacteria in your plant to digest as long as you can get it settled out. Uh, well, those things that end up in digesters are the same things that these redworms build their cocoons out of. So bug juice was designed to break those things down, um, and it works great when you add it at the front of your plant. It will help break down some of those cocoons on the walls of your basins, on your weirs, and also it'll help to degrade some of that sludge and dead spots in your aeration basin. Dosing for the bug juice, we have some plants who will use this anytime they're doing an aquabac dose, they'll, they'll do some bug juice. And, but more typical is that we would have you add it daily for at least like say the first 40 days of your treatment. Um, so we have you added at the head of the plant daily. The aquabac is still going to be once a week or twice a week, depending on where you're at in the, the time frame. And uh, typical dosing, again, let's say 500,000 gallon per day plant, you might be adding a little over a half gallon once per day for these 40 days. And that's a pretty typical dose. And again, it just takes the aquabac treatment up to the next level by exposing more of those red worms. So now we'll talk timeline for results. Usually people are gonna be seeing significant improvements within the first 14 days. And generally within seven days, we start getting feedback that, oh yeah, I can tell this is starting to work. Uh, full results, I'll say within 30. And again, typical within 30 days is 90% plus reduction. Uh, if you have a bunch of cocooning or a bunch of settled sludge, you might need to wait a bit beyond the 30 days just for the bug juice to finish doing its job. But the vast majority of treatment plants that we're treating are gonna end up with 90% reduction in their midge fly population and redworms. So it is really effective stuff. Uh, one other companion product I'll mention, a lot of times when folks get started on a new aquabac treatment, they may have been that plant where the redworms were consuming a lot of their mixed liquor. And they may be in a scenario where they don't have as much solids and mixed liquor built up as they'd like. And so we do have a product called Vitastem Rebuild. And as the name kind of implies, it's designed to rebuild your mixed liquor. Uh, typically, folks will do this for about a 15 to 30 day treatment. And it just adds new heterotrophic bacteria cultures to boost up that population of mixed liquor if it's a little bit weak. It also does contain some probiotics or stimulants that'll help with the native bacteria that are already in your plant helping them to function at a higher level and also grow more quickly. There's really not much out there in terms of competing products for BTI. Um, when you start looking at alternatives, really you're looking at things that generally are not gonna be great to add to your wastewater treatment plant. There's a chemical insecticide out there that's active ingredient is methoprene, and that acts as a hormone analog and it's, it's a growth regulator. So pretty similar to you know any of those other types of pesticides. I've heard stories about folks using seven dust. And again, these are not the kind of things you want to add into your treatment plant when your goal is to create a nice, healthy and safe effluent. Um, and then the big, big issue with like methoprene and other chemical insecticides I kind of touched on earlier is that uh, for chemical treatments, you're pretty much guaranteed to, to get resistance formed at some point. So plants that have been using methoprene based treatments for redworms, within a couple of years generally will start to see their results diminish. Um, and it's that's just the nature of the beast when you're using chemical insecticides. Um, and like I had mentioned, a lot of times the chemical insecticides actually have resistance management programs and you're trying to delay the inevitable in that case. The thing we love about Aquabac is they never get resistant to it. So up next, we're gonna do those special situations. 
we're going to talk about lagoons. We're going to talk about trickling filters. But first, got another poll to launch. So the question this time is, how long did you have? Did your treatment plant have redworms or midge flies before the first time you treated? I'm just kind of curious because so often when we work with a new customer for doing this, they've had them for years and either didn't know what they were exactly, or even more likely and more often is they've had them, but they just didn't realize that there was an easy and effective treatment out there and really pretty cost effective too, I might add for the vast majority of systems. We rarely have people who are actually priced out of doing a treatment like this. So get in touch with us afterwards if you'd like, and we'll put uh, pricing and dosing together based on your specific flows, but it's, it's almost always cost effective. So how long did you have redworms before you started treating? And this pretty much mirrors about what I was expecting, if not a little bit worse even. 15% uh, of people said zero to two years. 12% of people said three to five years. 20% of you had redworms for six or more years before treating for them. And 42% of you have had redworms in your plant and still haven't ever treated. So those 42%, I'm, I'm happy you made it here today. I would encourage you to look into treatment, uh, especially if they're causing issues of housekeeping or general nuisance or more operational issues. And then finally, the last answer is that 11% of you, I think, are just here for kind of informational purposes and, and actually have never had redworms in your treatment plant. Thank you, everyone who responded to the poll there. So up first is going to be lagoons. I've been dealing specifically with activated sludge plants for a lot of the treatment portion of this conversation. A lot of the same principles are applied to lagoons. You know, in a lot of ways, lagoons are just uh, a treatment plant, an activated sludge plant that has all these processes in one big basin and no ability to maintain a specific sludge age. But so you can apply a lot of these same principles. We do a treatment, we tend to base it on how much water is in the lagoon. Whereas activated sludge plants, we will base our treatment on the flow into the plant. Well, the bulk of your capacity in a lagoon, you know, it tends to dwarf your incoming flow. So we want to hit a certain concentration in lagoons. And so we do that based on the size of the lagoon. The conversation about sludge and worms burrowing down into settled sludge becomes especially important when you're talking about wastewater lagoons, because a lot of them tend to have sludge. Even, even relatively new ones might, you know, five-year-old sludge or five-year-old lagoon probably has a couple inches of sludge and 20 year old lagoon might have a couple feet of sludge. So Aquabac is gonna kill all the worms that comes into contact, especially the ones in the upper layer uh, of the sludge and any in the water column. But to really go the full, full distance on treatment for lagoons, we recommend managing that sludge. So dosing for wastewater lagoons on the Aquabac, uh, we're still looking at once per week as a standard dosing time frame. Uh, let's just say a one acre lagoon. And right now this chart you're looking at is based on typical municipal wastewater lagoon. Depths might be five feet to seven feet uh, roughly. For that lagoon, one acres in size, be looking at about two and a half gallons uh, once per week. Do that for four weeks and you should really get some good control with that as the initial dose. Beyond that, per acre, uh, probably looking at about one gallon once per week as your maintenance dose. You'll get some great improvement even doing just that. But again, to, to boost the performance, dealing with sludge is something we encourage. We do have a bacterial product called Sludge RX, which is a pretty innovative tablet type product um, that you would spread on the lagoon once per month. And these tablets actually sink down into the sludge and keep the bacteria in that tablet right in contact with the sludge. And it does a really good job of digesting the sludge. A typical treatment for that we do during the summer months. And you'd probably be looking at like five months of treatment and you could probably expect anywhere from 20 to 35% reduction in the sludge thickness. And that does expose a lot more of the worms to treatment and just helps to minimize the habitat that they can potentially exploit for continuing to grow. And the other one is an area where we have a good number of uh, customers who use Aquabac on trickling filters. And it's definitely possible for trickling filters to have the midge fly that we've been talking about through a lot of this presentation. But more commonly in trickling filters, you're going to be seeing uh, filter flies. And so these are Psychota is the species of fly. And you can see one pictured here. It's got quite a different appearance from what you might see from the midge flies. A much more rounded and shortened wing. It's got this kind of furry body. These are also 
kind of called drain flies, I think is what I've heard them referred to pretty frequently. Uh, but they're what you'd see in, in most trickling filter plants. And research on the active ingredient in Aquabac, that BT, uh, decades ago was performed on trickling filter plants and shown effective by some researchers in the University of Wales. Their recommendation for dosing on trickling filters is that you want to get a high concentration of the active ingredient into the filter for a duration of up to at least 30 minutes. So at that point in time, their recommendation was anywhere from 10 to 50 ppm of the Aquabac fed to the wastewater for at least a duration of 30 minutes. The duration, you can really set that based on how quick your uh, distribution arms go. You want to make sure that it gets at least a couple passes where the Aquabac is evenly being spread. A lot of times the Aquabac will kill the larvae stage, and a lot of times they tend to be up towards the the top of the material. So a couple passes once a week is a, a pretty good way to do it. You could do a couple passes every other week and still have really good results. We're, again, we're happy to put together dosing plans. Just uh, get in touch with us and put together what we recommend for your system. Now, there may be a subset of attendees here who've been watching this presentation and they know they've got red worms in their plant, but some of this isn't quite ringing exactly with what their experience is. So if you're watching this and you think, boy, my worms look quite a bit longer and narrower, or I've had red worms for a long time, but I've never seen a single midge fly in my plant, then you may be one of uh, a very unlucky set of customers or operators who has what's called tube effects worms. And these are quite a bit different from what we've been talking about. Tube effects worms pictured here, uh, you can see are actually, they're a true worm, a true annelid. So these do not hatch into any sort of fly species. Their common name is the sewer worm. And it's an area that's not well researched at all at this point. Aquafix uh, through our webpage that I'm showing you here at the bottom is one of the, I think the best resource on tube effects worms and wastewater systems. And We've compiled some case studies uh, about how to deal with these tube effects worms. It's an ongoing area of research for us, but just, I guess the, the main point on this slide is get in touch if you have this issue and that Aquabac isn't gonna kill these. Uh, like I'd mentioned, it's so selective in its targets, it's gonna be unaffected by the Aquabac if you have tube effects worms. And it's pretty apparent once you know what you're looking at. If you've seen this picture and the other red worm pictures prior to this, the difference is pretty apparent. So go take a close look if you aren't sure. And I'm having seen this presentation, I'm sure you'll know right away which one you have. So let's answer this one. So this person says we're a chemical plant with a with rinse water. They do stream condensate process water, rainwater. They have 450,000 gallons in holding. Oh, I'm sorry, 45,000 gallons in capacity of holding and 30,000 gallons in an EQ influent tank, then an 80,000 AB, and then 10,000 secondary clarifier capacity. Where should we add the bug juice? I would add it right at the start of that process. If there's anywhere that you know um, has sludge settled, I'm thinking about that EQ especially potentially might have some. The big deal on the bug juice is, you want to just add it immediately upstream of where you see that sludge that the worms are living in. So I would still go right towards the front of the treatment process in a case like that. Next question. Question about retention ponds used for stormwater drainage have the same problem. How prevalent is it? Um, how much would it cost to treat per year? Yeah, so any natural uh, water body is potentially going to have uh, midge flies and red worms in it. If you're looking at a retention pond, you're probably much less likely to have a bunch of the food and habitat that red worms use to really proliferate, like in a wastewater treatment lagoon. So a, let's say a retention pond just has a, you know, a little bit of organic material built up in the bottom. It's not nearly as nutrient rich as the organic material that's built up in the bottom of a wastewater pond. So retention ponds, yes, you could have an outbreak there. Uh, but I think it's a lot less likely to get as severe just because the total nutrient load and the richness of the carbon at the bottom of that retention pond, it just doesn't even come close to matching what they find in a, in a wastewater system. And that's really what it's all about and why these outbreaks get so bad in wastewater processes 
is because they love that as their food source. The uh, mixed liquor and other decaying organics that you find in wastewater make such uh, the survival rate so high, and it's such a great food source for them that they just flourish in those types of settings. Um, but treatment-wise, you'd still be looking at uh, potential Aquabac with that BT ingredient being just as effective there. Let's see what we have for other questions. Can you provide references or case studies for filter app fly applications on trickling filters? Yeah, I can provide references and I can also give you a copy of the uh, university study I referenced earlier that is you know, really well put together and shows effectiveness. Get in touch. The email address is gonna be info at teamaquafix.com. Question about uh, how can I ensure that the BTI does not carry through the treatment process into the effluent and receiving water? Uh, that's a question that I've never really had to deal with because there's generally no toxicity issues uh, with BTI in the receiving water. I don't think you would have any active concentration in most wastewater treatment plants, but I think this is one where I'd say get in touch with us after and I'll walk you through my thoughts on the question and I want to hear your perspective on it as well. Then uh, before we have everyone head their ways for the day, uh, I'll mention we have some other webinars coming up. The next one's going to be about harmful algae blooms in wastewater lagoons. Uh, you can see the lineup here on our screen. Everyone who's here probably knows how to get to the registration, but just go to our homepage and upcoming webinars for a link there. And we do have another question here. Our AB mixed liquor feeds into a chamber with a baffle just upstream of the clarifiers. Is this where we should add the Aquabac XT rather than the AB? So clarifiers are the most common spot where the red worms population is really bad. Uh, so that's why Yes, I would say in most cases, that's exactly what you'd want to do. In your case, you might consider confirming that you don't have a big population of them in any of your upstream processes. And you could probably do that by just grabbing a sample off the bottom if there's any settled solids or a sample of the bulk kind of mixed liquor. And if you look at that mixed liquor and a sample off the bottom and don't see any red worms in it, then probably the bulk of them are going to be in your clarifiers and I'd treat there. If you do see them in one of those upstream processes, then I'd make sure to get the aqua back there as well. You know, obviously if you add it downstream of where the worst area is, you're not going to end up treating the worst area. Rule of thumb is that secondary clarifiers are where the worst population tends to be, but you can do some sampling to confirm if you have issues farther upstream. A lot of activated sludge plants, if they have issues upstream, like in their aeration basin, a lot of, if they do like a daily settling test when they grab their sample to do their 30 minute settling, they'll usually see a couple red worms floating around in there. And if you see that, then treat the aeration basin as well as the clarifiers. In those cases, it's kind of unclear if they got there because of return activated sludge or if they're actually thriving and growing there. But so yeah, do a little survey, find out where they're worst in your system. Everything I'm telling you is kind of rule of thumbs. Yeah, I hope that was helpful. Our email address, you can get us at info at teamaquafix.com or the phone number on your screen. Just give that a call later today, tomorrow. Uh, number is 888-757-9577. And appreciate everyone for being here. I uh, look forward to seeing you all in the, the next session. Mm -hmm.